Hello, my name is Michael Schatz, and I'm a professor at Johns Hopkins University and also one of the co-leads for the Galaxy Project. Along with my colleague, Delphine Lariviere, we'll be talking about introduction to genome assembly, in the, and especially in the context of Galaxy. So I'm guessing everyone here is at least heard about genome assembly, but this is this process that starts with a biological sample here, for example, a human genome, but it could be any sort of plant, animal, or any other living thing. And what we want, ultimately want to do is sort of take it into a representation, you know, in a computer digital form of the genome sequence. Uh, along the way, we're often going to be interested in, to be able to do annotation and do comparative genomics and maybe use it as a foundation for functional genomics or other studies. But really, it all starts with that biological sample and being able to do sequencing, assembly, and then building out that uh, reference genome sequence to start with. So along this process, there's a few steps that you absolutely have to do. You have to do some sort of sequencing. And we'll talk in a minute about some of the advantages of or, and disadvantages of short and long read sequencing, some of the characteristics that you should pay, a lot, pay attention to. And then once you've done the DNA sequencing, the next step will be then this process, this computational process of de novo genome assembly where we'll be comparing all of those millions or billions of sequencing reads to each other in order to reconstruct the original genome sequence back again. So today we're, we're going to be talking about this process in a few different stages. To get started, I'm going to tell you about a, a pretty simple analogy that will hopefully introduce some of the concepts in a very uh, conceptual way that is very understandable. Then we'll talk about some of the real practical issues that are important to pay attention to when you're assembling a genome, things like how much coverage to collect, what sort of read lengths that you should aim for, uh, things you should watch out in terms of errors, and then crucially, uh, some of the challenges associated with repeats in the, in the genome as it complicates genome assembly. And the last part, I'm going to tell you uh, some of the latest work going on now for long read assembly. Uh, today, there's two commercially available platforms, PacBio and Oxford Nanopore. Tell you a little bit about how those platforms are working and how they're really um, the long read sequencing is really uh, revolutionizing de novo genome assembly to get really high quality reference genomes for uh, many many uh, plant and animal and other uh, large genome species. So the analogy I'm going to tell you uh, goes like this. So imagine your tale of, imagine that you're Charles Dickens and you just finished writing a tale of two cities, which begins, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, it was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness, it was the epic of belief, it was the epic of incredulity, the season of light, and on and on and on. So you're Charles Dickens, you just started uh, writing this book, and you know uh, you want to make many copies of it and sell it to the world, so you go to the print shop, and you're going to get the book printed onto long spools. So hopefully this is my totally transparent metaphor. Instead of having you know long molecules of DNA, we're going to have a long spool of paper that's going to have this text uh, spelled out on top, on top of it. So shown here are kind of the first five copies of this book, you know, again, in these long st strips of paper representing uh, the entire book that is printed there. So as, as Dickens you know, has his first few copies, as he's walking out of the print shop, unfortunately he trips and it falls into this paper shredder and then it chops up these long spools of paper into short, just like little short slips of paper. The slips of paper that are shown here each have five words on them, although it's sort of sheared and cut up uh, all across the book. Hopefully, again, this is my transport metaphor of you have long molecules of DNA, you have entire chromosomes, they get sheared, they get sequenced uh, into, into, you know, into some sort of sequencing reads. Today, with say Illumina short read sequencing, those sequencing reads will be maybe a few hundred nucleotides long. Uh, in the case of long read sequencing, those, those pieces are longer than short reads, there may be 10,000 or 100,000 bases long, but still compared to entire chromosomes, like mammalian chromosomes, that are hundreds of millions of bases long are still relatively short. You know, there may be 10,000 out of 100 million bases in a given read. So this long molecule is, uh, gets chopped up. We can do all the sequencing. By analogy here, we have long books. They get chopped up and we get all these slips of paper. And our sort of problem that we we're facing is, well, how can we reconstruct the task? How can we re reconstruct that original text? So each copy of A Tale of Two Cities is about 140,000 uh, words long. We have five copies, five words per fragment. We have about 140,000 fragments all jumbled together in this giant bag. Uh, they're all mixed together. We've lost track of you know, which fragments come from you know, the first page or the last page. We've lost track of the beginning of the sentence, the end of the sentence. All that sort of locality information is completely lost. Uh, again, you know, going back to our DNA model, um, analogy, when we chop up DNA and do sequencing, we've lost track of which reads come from chromosome 1 or chromosome 10 or whatnot. 
they're all kind of jumbled together. As we try to do this reconstruction problem, we're gonna to come to realize that a really important challenge is that some of the fragments in here are going to be identical. So here colored in yellow are two fragments of times it was the, and colored in blue, it was the age of. And it turns out those identical fragments are gonna be really, really important as we try to piece together the entire uh, genome from all these sequencing reads. So first thing you might wanna do is maybe just order them in sorted order. That can simplify, you know, kind of binary search like lookups throughout them, but it doesn't actually solve the problem of genome assembly. So a lot of uh, what a lot of the early genome assemblers did is a so-called greedy reconstruction. And it kind of, to this day, it sort of underlies a lot of the ideas that we still use in, in genome assembly. So in, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna pick some fragment. You know, maybe you do some analysis of the words that are there, uh, the sequences that are there. Uh, maybe you try to find ones that are common or maybe ones that you think are unique or do some analysis of them. But here, let's say we reach in here and alphabetically, there's only one fragment that starts with a capital letter. So that maybe that gives you a clue about where we should start thinking about doing this reconstruction. But there's, there's many different ways to do it. And kind of the whole uh, business of genome assembly is we have a fragment and we want to figure out which fragment comes next. Right, so we can, you know, this process is highly analogous to say uh, uh, completing a jigsaw puzzle where those jigsaw puzzle pieces lock together based on the shape. Here we're, we're going to have these little slips of paper locked together based on this, the words, the sequences that are written upon them. Specifically, we're looking for pairs of fragments where the end of one fragment matches the beginning of the another. That's, that's the key uh, concept that we're looking for. This is called an overlap. So as we're scanning through this list of fragments here, you know, you might have relatively short overlaps of just maybe a single letter or maybe a single word. Uh, in general, we're looking for the longest possible overlaps that we can. That's the greediness uh, in a greedy reconstruction is by looking for those long overlaps and preferring them over short overlaps. So scanning through this bag here, we can find another fragment that begins was the best of times that has a four word overlap, right? The first four word, excuse me, the last four words, the first fragment, match the first four words of the second fragment. They overlap, they connect, again, just like sort of a jigsaw puzzle uh, pieces they lock together. So each of these fragments are five words long, they share a four word overlap, but in combination, we have confidence that they go together and they start to spell out the, six, the first six words of the book. So we're starting to make progress here. So uh, as a good sort of computer science problem, once we've kind of figured out the rule to follow, we can just repeat it. We can find, uh, we can sort of scan through our uh, fragments here and find which fragment overlaps the next best. So now we've spelled out a uh, seven word reconstruction. We can continue this process in principle any number of times, right? We, we start, we're building out this partial reconstruction. We can scan through our list of fragments and just try to keep extending, keep extending, keep extending. Try to just keep extending as much as we can. Now, as we get into this though, there's gonna be a few sort of complexities that will arise that we'll have to pay a lot of attention to. So one uh, complexity is, is you might get ties. So as we're scanning through here, we found two fragments that, that overlap equally well. Uh, they happen to have the same words on them. So no problem, you know, we can, it's unambiguous how the reconstruction should go, although that will be a clue that something special is about to happen, that the, the fact that they have the same words on them. As we go to extend this again though, what we're gonna do is we're gonna encounter the situation where there are two kind of next fragments they, op they overlap equally well. They're both sort of maximal greedy possibilities here, but those fragments disagree with themselves. Uh, and this introduces ambiguity and, and it's just not clear. It's not, it's ambiguous. If the reconstruction should begin, it was the best of times, it was the worst, or it was the best of times, it was the age. There's just not quite enough information if we're just looking one over overlap at a time uh, to figure this uh, process out. Now, in the very, very early days of genome assembly, if, if you've heard of maybe FRAP or Tiger Assembler, some of these like very early, early um, assemblers, this is basically what they do. They, they would start randomly with some fragment, they would try to grow overlaps, they would go as far as you can, they would get stuck, and they would leave it to the sort of bench scientists to go back and do uh, directed PCR and other experiments in order to kind of resolve this ambiguity. Uh, modern genome assemblers, though, uh, uh, sort of try to tackle this uh, with sort of deeper computational insight, where we're going to be modeling all of these overlaps, all these relationships between the sequences in, in a graph, and then we can apply graph uh, algorithms and graph theory in order to improve upon uh, the reconstruction. So over the years, there's been a few different graphs that have been pro proposed for genome assembly. 
A very popular and widely used one for short read assembly in particular is the so-called De Bruijn graph uh, framework. So the framework uh, was kind of invented in the 1940s by a mathematician, De Bruijn, but starting in the late 90s and 2000s has been heavily adopted for, for sort of genome analysis. Um, it has some really nice properties, especially for short reads that make it uh, quite efficient in order to kind of catalog all of these overlaps and be able to build a graph of even very large um, genome assembly problems. So the graph is assembled and is constructed in a somewhat counterintuitive way. We're going to be starting with, with relatively short fragments. The fragments that we have in this example are just five words long. Uh, and from them, we're going to derive even shorter subfragments. So we're going to go from five word fragments down into subfragments that have each uh, four words on them. And then the key thing is, is when we're driving these subfragments, we're going to keep track of the edges between them. So it was the, because of this first fragment here, can be derived into it was the best and was the best of. We're going to keep track of this edge here between it was the best and was the best of. Now, from the next uh, fragment, we derive it into short read, even shorter uh, subread fragments. Uh, but uh, interestingly, that will take us from was the best of into the best of time. So we can sort of keep track of all these ed edges. Notice here, this subfragment was the best of is repeated in some other uh, fragment. And that's what lets us sort of build out this chain uh, of how these sequences are related to each other. So that's sort of the key concept is because these subfragments can be shared, we're going to be implicitly computing the overlaps between these fragments and hopefully build up a graph of how all those overlaps relate to each other. So here's me sort of simulating Charles Dickens, taking all those five word fragments, uh, uh, chopping them into sub four word sub fragments and sort of kind of carefully laying them out so that we can sort of build up a graph about how that those first uh, dozen or so fragments all relate to each other in terms of the, the words and sequences that they spelled out. So just by eye, we can start to see that some regions are relatively simple. You know, up here in the top left corner, it's unambiguous. Some parts are more complicated where you can have cycles where the you know, potential paths circle back on itself. And these cycles can kind of loop through and you know, potentially have um, cycles upon cycles inside of them. So in practice, what we want to do is we're going to build this graph you know, in a, following just this very simple rule, you know, just a few dozen lines of Python, you could easily implement this. Uh, and then, you know, once we have this initial graph constructed, what we're going to try to do is try to simplify it as much as possible. So we're going to look for these parts of the graph that are unambiguous and kind of simplify, compress, compact the graph uh, into these sort of representations. So it all started out with, you know, five word fragments cut up into four word subfragments. But through this compaction process, we're able to spell out, you know, longer stretches. So here, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven words spelled out in this first node of the graph. We, we can't quite compact it further than that because we have to resolve some of these cycles, some of these branching edges, uh, where, and that's where all the complexity is coming out, uh, coming from. Uh, that's one of the sources, major sources of complexity in a de novo assembly problem. Now here in English, just by looking at this, we're pretty sure you know the word, the book starts here and then would cycle through once here and once there and then make our way out. And in English, that would generally be a safe thing to do. Although if we're going to be talking about de novo genome assembly, you know, it, it is common to go through those cycles many times. That would be a tandem repeat. So in English, it would be very awkward to write, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, it was the worst of times, the age of wisdom, the age of wisdom, the age of wisdom, age of... It'd be very awkward in English to write that. But in a genome sequence, it is very common to have those tandem repeats uh, where you're uh, maybe un ambiguous, uncertain about how many times to pass through there. Uh, so uh, furthermore, if you look across, you know, the whole genome, across the whole book, you know, because all the fragments are all jumbled together, you can very quickly run into more complexity where there can be many, many sort of uh, cycles and many, many potential paths uh, through the graph that is, um, that is sort of constructed out of the, the short sequence fragments. So here, this um, construct of it was the, is very common in um, Dickens' uh, uh, language. So it becomes kind of one of these nodes where a lot of um, paths pass through it. So, he, so here's a sort of a biological example about how this might look like. So this is taking the E. coli genome. That's about a 5 million base pair bacterial genome. It's a circular genome. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to consider all the 50 word sub fragments. So uh, when it's length 50, that's called a camer. Uh, and here the camer length would be 50. So this is sometimes called a 50 mer. 
So we're going to take the original full genome and we're going to extract the first 50 characters. And then we'll shift it over by one, the next 50 characters, the next 50 characters, the next 50 characters, the next 50 characters. Do that over the entire 5 million base pair uh, sequence. Uh, that will, the initial graph there will be about 50, uh, excuse me, the initial graph there will be about 5 million nodes long because the genome is about 5 million uh, bases long. Uh, although the little sequences upon them will each be 50 characters long. That'll be the, the initial graph. And then once you do this compaction operation, you'll get a graph that looks like this, uh, where there's you know perhaps 100 nodes that remain. But you'll notice across all these nodes, you get lots of branching along the way. Uh, here we're showing if there's kind of two edges between a pair of nodes, that's a so-called multi-edge. That just means you have to kind of visit that, that sequence uh, some number of times, multiple times. Uh, here, because we're working from a reference genome, we know exactly uh, how many times to visit each node. Uh, furthermore, even though the genome is circular, it's commonly represented as a linear string. So this must be the very end of that linear string because there's no way to kind of proceed in the graph um, to come out of it. The point I'm trying to make here is even with a relatively simple bacterial genome, after this compaction process, there's still a lot of complexity here. Now, there are algorithms that are quite efficient for finding potential paths to this graph. Uh, but I would argue that you know, any potential uh, path through the graph at this point is going to be ambiguous. What we really need to do is bring additional information, uh, biological information, genomic information, uh, to the assembly problem in order to resolve all this complexity and resolve exactly which path uh, we should be using. So at the process here, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna start from this very simple graph that will start at the level of individual camers. We'll grow up these longer sequences as far as we can. Now, of course, what we want is to assemble the whole chromosome or the whole genome into one big contig. But in practice, uh, because of repeats and other complexities, you're not going to necessarily be able to get the whole genome, the whole um, chromosome into a single contig. Your assembly is often going to be in many pieces. Those are called contigs. Uh, some of those contigs will be large. Some of those contigs will be smaller. And you want to sort of be able to uh, sort of you know, quickly summarize that size distribution. There are many potential metrics that you might do, right? If you have large contigs, you have small contigs, you could pick, say, the mean, or you could pick the median. Uh, those sort of simple summary statistics tend to get sort of um, bogged down, if you will, by all the short contigs that may remain. You know, if you're computing the mean or the median, it's sort of going to be weighted heavily based on these short contigs and miss the fact that there are, you know, some quite large contigs available as well. So in the world of genome assembly, the most common metric to sort of characterize an assembly is the so-called contig N50 size. It's very easy to compute, right? You have your, your genome. In this case, let's say it's 1 million bases long. We just take our contigs from longest to shortest. We lay them out in sort of that sorted order. And we just sort of keep walking through this list here until we hit the halfway point. So uh, the halfway point here, of halfway of a one megabase pair genome would be 500,000 base pairs. So 300 doesn't reach halfway. 300 plus 100 doesn't uh, get halfway. 300 plus 100 plus 45 plus 45 plus 30 does exceed halfway. So we, we would report that the, that the N50 size of this assembly is 30 KB. Now, if we had an alternate assembly of the same genome, right, it could be the same assembler with different parameters, or it could be an entirely different assembler with different data types. You know, for whatever reason, we have a different assembly of the same genome. And be, again, we list the contigs from largest to smallest. We repeat the same process of, well, how far down this list do we need to go in order, until we get to the 50% of the genome size? And in this assembly, that's only 3 KB only 3 KB. So the mean or median may be pretty similar here, but the N50 size you know, highlights that there's a bigger difference in this distribution. Here we still have a 30 KB contig uh, at the halfway point. Here we only have, say, a 3 KB contig at the halfway point. So uh, in general, you know, what we, when we're assembling a genome, uh, that N50 size is one of the key metrics that we're going to pay attention to. In general, we want that to be as big as possible. Uh, in the limit, we're going to be always limited by the size of the genome. Your N50 cannot be larger than your genome size. Uh, you know, for, for eukaryotic species, you're also going to be limited by your chromosome sizes. Uh, so in the case of, say, the human genome, the total haploid genome size is about three gigabases, but the largest individual chromosome is only about 250 uh, million bases. So the contig N50 size is going to be limited 
can never be more than the largest chromosome. <laughs> in reality, in the case of the human genome, because the size distribution ranges from about 250 million bases down to about 50 million bases, uh, the, the maximum uh, N50 size you get in the human genome is about 150, 120 megabases. That's sort of comparable to a, a middle size uh, chromosome uh, in the genome. But when we do this problem and we get, you know, an assembly, we get an N50 size, we're generally looking for as big a context as possible. We want the best N50s uh, as possible. So that'll give you better resolution of the genes and their flanking regulatory sequences, give you better resolution of transposons and other complex sequences, give you resolution of the chromosome's sort of structure and organization, just better sequence, better um, uh, reference for basically almost any sort of downstream analysis with, with bigger and better N50 sizes. One thing to be careful is, is you know, there is sort of great inflation potentially. <laughs> a very bad genome assembler just sort of concatenates all the reads together irrespective of the overlaps between them. If you're using small overlaps that may overlap, the reads may overlap by one base and this is gonna just lead to nonsensical uh, overlaps and nonsensical re uh, reconstruction. So we want those overlaps to be long. We want them to you know, be confident. We want the genome to be sort of correctly uh, represented. Okay, so that hopefully sort of introduces some of the, the concepts. Um, uh, it's, you know, the process is gonna be take the fragments, build a graph out of it, look for paths in the graphs. The graphs will be branching because there's largely, because there's gonna be a sort of repeats and other complexity that will be present there. Uh, rarely are we going to be able to get the whole genome assembled into a single contig, but nevertheless, we want those contigs that are reported uh, to be as, as big as possible. Now, if we're going to do this, you know, for, for, you know, as a real experiment, there's some real practical issues that you have to pay attention to in order to get a good genome assembly uh, to come out of your to come out of your species and come out of your um, uh, uh, project of study. Now, there's many different applications of genome assembly in the world today. Uh, so a premier one is the so-called vertebrate genomes project that aims to assemble a representative um, uh, animal from every vertebrate species on the planet. There's more than 70,000 vertebrate species. So obviously this is a wildly ambitious project in order to go back and, and sort of uh, develop reference genomes for all those different uh, sequences that are out there. Uh, but in addition to vertebrates, this sort of style is coming up in many different contact, contexts. Here's, an, here's a logo from the Insect 5K, B, 5, Insect 5K project uh, on path to assemble 5,000 in, uh, insects. I've heard of projects looking at 5,000 or many thousands of different plant species, of microbes, of fungi. You know, it, it, basically every species that has any sort of biological interest is now, now uh, a candidate uh, for genome assembly for establishing a reference genome just again because it's such an enabler of all the studies of developmental biology of comparative genomics of evolutionary biology uh, if you're looking for sort of clinical variants a good reference genome is important if you're looking at genes or pathways right you just need a good genome assembly uh, to be able to do this so those are you know those are characterized by basically looking at one genome in isolation getting a nice reference genome for it uh, from out of the assembler a related problem is the is, is so-called metagenomics, where we're, we're going to be you know, doing sequencing and we're potentially be doing assemblies, but we're not going to isolate necessarily one species at a time. There could be a complicated mixture of many species being assembled all at the same time. So this HMP, this is the Human Microbiome Project. So that's a great example where they were looking at all the microbes that live on us and with inside of us at many different body sites across many different individuals. Another example has been um, the Global Ocean Survey, where researchers sailed around the world collecting seawater and sort of sequencing all the microbes that are living there. These sorts of studies have been uh, extremely interesting uh, and just given us a lot of information about the different species that you know, live on us and in our planet. And there's sort of growing evidence about the important roles that all these bacteria and, and other micro or, uh, organisms play in human health. They play in the environment. Uh, they're just sort of critically important. And but although they're just uh, there's just so many species, uh, there's a lot of uh, unknowns that are uh, actively being researched. Uh, other things that I wanted to highlight is in addition to kind of assembling one genome at a time, that's you know de novo assembly, or or assembling many genomes at a time, that's metagenomics. These uh, assembly algorithms and data structures come up in many other sort of genomics uh, applications. So if you're looking for say structural variants, even if you have a good reference uh, available, 
you know, you may want to be able to do de novo assembly, especially so that say long insertions, you can sort of piece those together, uh, even if you're, go you're going to just be placing them back on a reference genome to annotate where they occur. Uh, if you're not so interested in, in DNA, maybe you're more interested in RNA. Um, there is a, a sort of related approaches that where you would do a transcript assembly, where you, from RNA sequencing reads, you would try to assemble uh, the full uh, uh, transcript, uh, uh, get the sort of, in order to resolve all the isoforms that are present there. Uh, it, and then beyond sort of DNA and RNA, um, you know, if you're doing, say, ChIP-seq, you could assemble the ChIP-seq reads to figure out the little contigs, the little regions uh, where there might be protein binding, for example. Um, so really, depending on the assay you're doing, these data structures, these algorithms uh, may play a really important role behind the scenes um, beyond just uh, for DNA sequence analysis. So people have been attempting to assemble genomes for decades now, <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, it remains a very hard uh, problem to tackle for a variety of, of reasons. So uh, biologically, right, the human genome has basically two copies of every chromosome or diploids, but other species uh, may have uh, more copies per chromosome. Uh, the human genome has relatively low rates of heterozygosity where the maternal and paternal haplotypes differ, but with larger genomes with higher ploidy, there could be more heterozygosity. There can also be uh, very extensive repeat content. Uh, shown here is a, a picture of wheat that you might eat in your bread or cereals. Um, certain types of wheat have as many as six copies of every chromosome with a lot of variability between them and a lot of uh, repetitive elements between them. This sort of biologically makes it very difficult to assemble uh, those genomes. Uh, in terms of the actual sequencing process, you know, large genomes just will require more sequencing. Uh, the, all, sequence, all sequencing instruments make mistakes, be it from Illumina, be it from PacBio, for Oxford Nanopore, or beyond. They all make mistakes, and we need some uh, sort of strategies to overcome the mistakes that are made there. Uh, because genomes can be quite large, you know, we're going to need a lot of sort of computational resources um, in order to be able to put together these graphs and be able to analyze them. And the last thing I wanted to highlight is, you know, to this day, it remains hard um, to uh, assess the correctness although there are some uh, new pipelines that are being developed um, that, will, that will highlight, that will help you sort of characterize the accuracy of the sequence that is reconstructed. Okay, so the process that we're gonna follow to be able to assemble a genome is very much what we just saw for that shredded book little uh, analogy. It starts with sequencing of the sample that you're interested in. You know, uh, you know you're not gonna be able to sequence through an entire chromosome. So we're going to have to shear it, cut it up into small pieces, be able to uh, sequence those pieces. Then we can assemble some sort of graph of all of those reads. We could build a Bruin graph, or we could build an overlap graph or related forms uh, where we're just going to be comparing the reads directly to themselves. Then we can simplify this graph and hopefully build up some long contigs that will be sort of partial reconstructions of the chromosomes. And then we, hopefully we can bring other information to the table where then we could then detangle all this graphs uh, and be able to assemble uh, li linear uh, chromosomes along the way. So if you're going to attack a new uh, species where you want a good reference genome, there's a few ingredients that you just absolutely have to have in order to get a good assembly. At the top of the list is sufficient coverage, right? The sequencing process is random, uh, so there's sort of no guarantee intrinsically that you're going to find overlapping reads. So the strategy is to oversample the genome with the amount of sequencing that you're going to do such that you have uh, higher chances, higher likelihood that there will be long overlaps. And we'll, we'll say a lot more about coverage uh, in just a minute. Uh, the next ingredient is, you know, we want our uh, sequencing to be sort of sufficiently long reads that we can resolve the repeats that are present there, or at least most of the res uh, repeats that are there. So if we built a De Bruijn graph you know, between these reads here, we could be uh, uncertain about if we come in on the green edge, should we leave uh, through orange or through pink here? Uh, but if we had longer reads, we could resolve this ambiguity and we, we could realize that green goes to orange and blue goes uh, to pink there. So that uh, the length that you need very much depends on the genome sequence that you're trying to uh, assemble. As a rule of thumb, bacterial genomes are much smaller than, say, vertebrate genomes. You can get away with shorter reads. Uh, but even, uh, even still, uh, if you want you know, uh, sort of complete reference genomes for available for microbes or for vertebrates or other sort of large eukaryotes, we generally want longer reads to get through the repetitive elements uh, that are present there. 
And then the last sort of ingredient that we have to have is, is sort of high quality, um, right? When we're uh, assembling a genome, we're looking for kind of the similarities between reads either exactly uh, by breaking it down into camers or uh, just by comparing one read to another. If there's very high error rate there, it'll sort of confuse which reads are connected to which, uh, and it'll lead to sort of a poor uh, assembly outcome. Uh, fortunately, in the modern era, you know, the platforms that are most relevant, you know, sort of Illumina sequencing, PacBio Hi-Fi, uh, Oxford Nanopore sequencing has, um, you know, a relatively low error rate. Um, in the case of, say, Illumina, we're talking about less than 1%. Hi-Fi reads also less than 1%. Less than 1%. Oxford Nanopore, uh, the sort of accuracy there, the modal accuracy will be maybe 1% or 2% error although some of the reads will have 5% error that will need uh, some strategy to, uh, to accommodate for those. But the good news is, is you know, we're getting you know, at least 95% accuracy um, so that we can get um, you know, kind of really high quality overlaps um, derived from that, those sequencing data sets. Okay, so if you have those ingredients, uh, you know, as I mentioned, one of the key ones is that notion of coverage. And that's driven by this idea, you know, the sequencing is random. There's sort of no guarantees about where the reads are gonna come from. So the strategy is to oversample the genome so that we have enough information that we can likely be able to detect where there's overlapping reads. So the analogy is, is something like we have raindrops that are falling on a sidewalk. When the first raindrop falls on the sidewalk, right, it'll be isolated. It'll just be one little wet raindrop. Uh, but, and then as the second one falls, it's unlikely that those two raindrops will sort of touch or connect to each other. But eventually with enough raindrops, there'll be enough sort of water that are present there that the whole sidewalk will start to get filled in. And then with enough rain, enough coverage, eventually everything will be wet. Everything will be touched uh, through this process. So that's sort of the goal here is we're gonna do this over sampling and, and then hopefully everything will be well covered along our genome uh, inside of our contig, right? The most crucial thing is any place along there that where the coverage goes to zero We'll just have no representation there, no reads there. It'll be impossible to be able to assemble. But even at like 1x coverage or 2x coverage or low coverage, there's going to be the possibility where, you know, as you dip into those low coverage, um, there's going to be the possibility of just more errors, right? If, if your coverage dips down to 1x coverage, you're going to be relying on to a single read, which may have, you know, 5% error or more in the case of Oxford Nanopore. Uh, and you may that may be problematic if those you know those higher error regions are incorporated into your reference assembly. So, uh, for a lot of different reasons, we want high coverage along the way. Now we want high coverage, um, but at the same time we don't want to have excessive coverage, right? Uh, the coverage is expensive. Uh, it, it determines you know how many flow cells are needed or you know what what fraction of a flow cell are needed. So we want to collect as much information as possible. Um, such that we are you know, pretty confident we'll cover the whole uh, genome, but we don't want to collect too much. Otherwise, we're going to be kind of wasting money um, by having excessive coverage along the way. Uh, so the analysis of you know, how much coverage is needed uh, goes like this. So um, let's imagine we have a much simpler scenario where our genome is, consists of a thousand different possible uh, positions, a thousand different nucleotides. Uh, and then we're going to be doing the equivalent of a thousand base pairs worth of sequencing. Now, in this real simple analogy, we'll imagine our reads are only one base pair long, although obviously that's silly because, you know, the reads won't overlap. You won't know where they go. But let's imagine the reads are one base pair long and they're, and they're, and they're numbered so you know exactly where the reads uh, should fall. It turns out that, you know, having 100 base pair reads or even 10,000 base pair reads doesn't really change the analysis when you're, when you're, when your genome sequences are much longer than your reads, it, 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 you can sort of simplify the analysis by imagining that they're only one base pair long. So here I have this sort of imaginary genome that's a thousand bases long, a thousand bins long, and I'm distributing the equivalent of a thousand bases of sequencing. Uh, in this plot here, it's all random. It's just in silico, you know, each one of these little reads will be distributed randomly. If you've taken a statistics class before, you may have heard of this as being a balls and bins experiment where I have a thousand balls distributed into a thousand bins. And you know, every time I run the program, I get a slightly different profile, but it looks like this. Now I've distributed a thousand balls into a thousand bins. So of course, on average, there is one bin per, uh, there is one ball per bin. That's the average, uh, but some places have a bit more. So here's a place you know, where there's two, three, four, five, maybe six, uh, bins of uh, six balls that have been distributed into this bin. 
AKA there's six reads that have fallen at this uh, position in the genome. And you no, know, that's perhaps a good thing. Although every place that there's more than one read um, or one ball falling there means other parts of this sort of uh, genome sequence here will be having zero reads or zero balls. And that's really bad news when you're trying to do assembly. Again, any place where there's zero reads in your coverage, there's just no information in, or, in order to put together uh, the assembly. Uh, there's no way that you can re reconstruct it. So if you're doing this sort of analysis and you've done you know, the equivalent of 1x coverage of your, seno of your genomes, so that means if you had a, you know, a 1 million base pair genome and you sequence 1 million base pairs and reads, that 1x coverage, uh, you're going to be missing a lot of your genome along the way. Every time you do it, of course, the profile will be a little bit different. But if you sort of tally this up, and that's what this little histogram is showing, about a third of your genome will have 0x coverage if you've, on average, uh, sequenced uh, 1x coverage, about a third. This is like one of these hard statistical facts. Um, and the reason for that is about a third will have no coverage, about a third will have 1x coverage, and about a third of your genome will have more than 1x coverage. And that's effectively steals away coverage from other places. Um, and that creates all those coverage holes where you have no x, where you have just sort of zero reads that are present there. So having 1x coverage of a, you know, of a genome is just not enough. Um, you'll be missing about a third of it. You know, the, the human genome is about three gigabases long, so you'll be missing about one gigabase out of that assembly. Um, uh, in, 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 in reality, you may even be missing more than that um, if all you've done is collected 1x sequencing. So what can you do? You can, do uh, you can collect more sequencing data, get higher coverage. So if you collect twice as much data as the sort of size of the genome, that's called 2x sequencing. So if, you, if your genome was 1 million bases, but you collected 2 million bases of reads, that would be 2x coverage. Uh, and that will improve things. Uh, instead of having about a third of your genome have uh, no coverage, about uh, 10 or 15% now will have no reads. Uh, but that will push out the average to be 2x coverage, and then you'll get some places that have uh, close to 10 reads that are present there. If we double up the coverage again, uh, so now we're at 4x coverage, we're down to just a few percent of your genome having no reads, uh, and you know the average coverage is moved up to 4, and then you know, you'll get some places now that will have even higher than 10x coverage. Uh, now, uh, you know, a few percent having 0x coverage may seem okay, but again, times 3 billion base pairs in the genome, even a few percent could translate into many tens of millions of bases where there's just no coverage. If we push this out further to say 8x coverage, um, now we expect more than 99% of your genome finally to have at least one, uh, one read covering it. In the early days of sequencing, especially in the so-called Sanger error of sequencing where reads were extremely expensive, the target for genome assembly was always 8x coverage because that was sort of the minimum uh, amount of coverage that you needed in order to have some sort of statistical um, uh, likelihood that you'd have at least 99% of the genome covered uh, in some read. doesn't necessarily mean your uh, assembly will be that good, but that's the bare minimum of what you would need 8x coverage. Today, as sequencing has gotten cheaper, you know, a good rule of thumb is to go even higher. Uh, typically, you would want maybe 15x coverage of each haplotype. Uh, in the case of the human genome, a diploid species, that means in reality you want about 30x coverage so that you have good representation of both haplotypes uh, in order to kind of um, resolve the genome and resolve those heterozygous variations that, uh, are, that will be present there. Oh, uh, one thing I was going to say is this shape here, right, this sort of normal looking shape, if we back it out, becomes less and less normal looking. Uh, strictly speaking, this shape here is called the Poisson distribution. Uh, and that's a really important distribution for genomics. You know, whenever you're doing sort of sequencing assays, be it for DNA, for RNA, for epigenomics, for functional assays, uh, behind the scenes, there's going to be one of these Poisson distributions that will relate, you know, how much coverage you're targeting and, and what sort of that distribution will be there, uh, where you'll get a bit of spread, um, at, especially at the low end, uh, where the sort of the coverage will be all kind of um, uh, highly concentrated around the low coverage. And then as you get to deeper and deeper coverage, it'll spread out more and more. One interesting fact about the Poisson distribution is that level of spread, the standard deviation, is the square root of the mean. So that's a pretty tight uh, uh, standard deviation. If you had sequenced, say, 100x coverage overall, the square root of 100 is 10. 
So uh, you would expect, you know, within two standard deviations, you expect your genome will be between say 80 and 120 X coverage if you've targeted 100 uh, X coverage on average. So that Poisson distribution underlies all the analysis that you're gonna do about how much coverage to generate uh, and how to do, uh, you know, how we should think about what that coverage spread is gonna look like. But if you're, again, if you're targeting say 15 X per haplotype, you know, 30 X total in, in the case of a diploid genome, you'll have very high likelihood that every base will be sequenced uh, so that hopefully you'll get um, a good assembly, assuming that there's not too much error and your reads are long enough to get through the common repeats. So a, a, a key question that comes up when you're doing an analysis like this is, okay, may, say we want to target 30x, or maybe we want to be even a little bit more generous and target, say, 50x coverage. You know, often you don't know exactly how large the genome size is when you're working in a novel species, right? Maybe best you can do is there's some... Um, you know, maybe there's a karyotype, maybe you're doing flow cytometry or some other molecular measurement to get some idea of the genome size, but uh, uh, but you could be in a totally novel species and you just and you don't really know. So what's kind of interesting is there's a lot of information that you can get from raw sequencing data uh, even before the assembly is done, including you can get some estimates about the genome size, you can get estimates on the accuracy of your sequencing, you can get a lot of estimates about repeat composition. There's a lot of good information you can get even from reads before you assemble them. So the idea is sequencing coverage is just this really simple uh, division here. You take the total amount of bases that you sequence, you divide it by the genome size, that will give you the amount of oversampling that will determine the sequencing coverage. Now this little formula here can easily be rewritten where the genome size now is if you, if you know the total amount of bases that you sequence and you divide it by the coverage, that will immediately read out what is the genome size that is present there. That's sort of the, 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 the simple algebra in order to, to infer the genome size given these other properties of the sequencing data. So let's, let's assume you've sequenced you know, 100 gigabases of data total. Somehow you knew that you had 50x uh, coverage there. That would imply that your initial genome size is, is two gigabases in size. So that's you know, very simple math in order to determine the genome size based on just sequencing data. We, we had 100 gigabases, we had, we knew that we had 50x coverage, so we can immediately determine what the genome size is. So that, you know, the, the, the numerator over here is quite straightforward, because, right, that's just determined by how much sequencing you've done. You just sort of add up how long all the reads are, tally that up there. Although it does leave a question about, well, how do we know the coverage that you've measured uh, in a sequencing run if you don't know the genome size? Interestingly, it is possible to estimate the coverage uh, even without having the, the, the complete genome available for you, there is a way to do that. And we'll talk about that um, in the next few slides here. Okay, so how do we figure out this uh, coverage without the genome? The key insight for this is you can do analysis of the reads even before you assemble them uh, to be able to get an, an idea about how common different um, parts of the word, how common different parts of the reads are, uh, and that will be proportional to the coverage that we have here. So if we had a set of reads, and here's just you know very short seven base pair uh, reads here, if if from those uh, individual reads we camerize them, break them up in, into all their constituent camers, uh, we can do things like uh, list all the camers across all the reads. We can do things like put them into sorted order. Uh, another important thing you could do is then count how often these different camers occur. So ACA here uh, occurs three times, AGA occurs twice, ATT occurs once. We can build up a big profile about how many curimers occur uh, different numbers of times. We can build up a profile and say, oh yes, there are three camers that occur once, three camers that occur twice, two camers that occurs three times. Notice here, nowhere along the way do we need a genome assembly. We can just sort of read out from the reads, we can get up this occurrences table. And the key idea is that these occurrences are directly proportional to the coverage that you've done uh, for your sequencing. So all these operations can be done from individual reads. Uh, we can tally up how frequent different cameras occur. That will give you a really good clue about uh, the overall um, genome coverage. Another kind of practical benefit for this is there's good tools. There's uh, algorithms. Uh, there's uh, a bunch. One's called Jellyfish. One's called KMC. Uh, there's newer ones uh, called um, FastK. There's one, something called Merrill. There's, there's a variety of tools that can do this analysis, even over very large uh, read data sets. Even if you have hundreds of gigabases of sequencing data in your uh, FASTQ files, there are good tools to scan through them and build up these tables about how often different cameras occur and then tally up. This is called the camera profile. 
about how many carry mirrors occur, uh, how many times across your whole uh, read data set. As an example, this is the real profile, that's the borrowers, uh, showing a real read data set uh, from a human genome. I knew it was from a human genome. Uh, in total, we sequence about 120 gigabases uh, from a female, uh, a, a female human genome. Uh, we know, you know from other work, of course, that the haploid human genome size is about three gigabases. Uh, and indeed, if we sort of look at this plot here, the top of this peak is about 40x coverage. So, you know, just by uh, sort of scanning through, in this case, the luminous sequencing, telling up how many, uh, how often different cameras occur, uh, we can immediately just look at the plot and see, oh yes, we have about 40X coverage here. Uh, if we divide that into the total amount of data we have, we can immediately determine, um, uh, uh, in this case, we could determine the genome size. Uh, there, we notice here that um, in addition to kind of this main peak that we're interested in, there's also a bunch of cameras that occur, you know, exactly one time or two times or three times, some small number of times. These are largely driven by errors in your reads, right? It, it, uh, if you just sort of have reads that have, you know, that span different parts of them, if you just randomly introduce mistakes, it's very unlikely that that new camera will be someplace else in the genome. So those mistakes will create, KMERS will create sequences that no other read has or, or very few other reads have. So when you look at these profiles, it's very common to have, um, in addition to kind of the main peak you're interested in, this very high spike of, of KMERS that occur very, uh, very, very many times. Um, you know, have a huge number of KMERS that occur say once or twice or three times. Those are generally errors. There are some statistical approaches to try to correct those errors. Um, uh, but you know, it's also something you can do is you can sort of measure the error rate of your sequencing data by looking at how many KMERS are error uh, compared to how many KMERS fall into this main peak. Another thing you could do is look at sort of the rest of this distribution. Here it's only plotted out to 100, but there will be some KMERS that occur 1,000 times, some KMERS occur 10,000 times. In some very large genomes, you may find KMERS that occur millions of times uh, in your read data set. And the amount of coverage that is there will be proportional uh, to how many times that KMER occurs in your in your reference genome in your real genome sequence, so that that means if you get KMERs that occur you know tens of thousands or millions of times, that's because those KMERs are occurring thousands of times, hundreds of thousands of times in the genome sequence. Typically, when you do an analysis like this, you'll be looking at KMERs that are you know 21 or 25 nucleotides long, so those individual sequences may occur many, many, many thousands of times across the genome. Uh, again, if you think back to that sort of Dickens analogy, uh, those repetitive cameras will form all of the cycles, all of the loops in the graph where all the challenges uh, will fall in uh, that we'll need to address. Uh, another thing you can do, especially if you're moving into, um, uh, you know, kind of wild species or species where there's been just a lot of heterozygosity in them, you can do a camera-based analysis in order to measure the level of heterozygosity in your sample, uh, even without a genome assembly. So the idea is, let's imagine you had a pair of reads that sort of come from homologous regions of some chromosome, let's say they're you know, sort of chromosome 1A, chromosome 1B. These sequences are quite similar, but here I've highlighted where there's a heterozygous um, single nucleotide variant, where in, on copy 1A, there's a G nucleotide, but on 1B, there's a T nucleotide uh, uh, present at, at sort of the corresponding position. Now, as we're taking these reads and we're kind of deriving the individual KMERS, you know, most of the KMERS are going to be identical. So here's this KMER ATG, identical to this KMER ATG. So you're, you're going to effectively get, you know, across the read set, you know, homozygous regions, meaning they don't have heterozygous variation between them. Homozygous variants, you're going to tend to get a, a KMERS rep coming from mom in the maternal haplotype and KMERS coming from uh, dad, coming from the paternal haplotype, you know, chromosome 1A, chromosome 1B. You're going to get double sort of representation of those KMERS. As we move across, though, there'll be the set of KMERS that touch these heterozygous bases. Here, our, our KMERS are only three MERS. So here we're getting three KMERS that touch this heterozygous variant. Uh, but you'll get a set of KMERS that touch those heterozygosities and then they'll exclusively come from the maternal or come from the paternal haplotype. So instead of getting double the representation, you'll just get solo representation of those KMERS in your distributions. So uh, the key thing to keep in mind is uh, heterozygous KMERS will have about half the coverage as those homozygous uh, KMERS, where you'll get um, representation from both haplotypes. 
Now, if you're working in a species with even higher ploidy, uh, you're in a I don't know, triploid or tetraploid species, the same sort of analysis plays out, but instead of just having you know, kind of simple one or two X coverage, you may have three X coverage, four X coverage, or beyond, you know, six X coverage in the case of hexaploid, uh, where you'll get sort of different levels of variation depending on how those variants are distributed across all the uh, haplotypes that are present there. What's interesting though, is if you do this sort of analysis and you sort of profile the Kamer distribution, you know, if you look at the, at the, look at the plots, you look at the peaks, You'll, you'll often see two peaks that are present there, where you'll get um, uh, the first peak representing the, the heterozygous camers, the second peak representing the homozygous uh, camers. And the interesting thing is the sort of relative heights of these two peaks is directly proportional to the heterozygosity of the sample. So low heterozygosity, that first peak will be quite short. Uh, when you have about one, one and a quarter percent heterozygosity, the two peaks will be relatively balanced. As you move into two to five percent heterozygosity or more, that first peak will be very tall uh, relative to the second peak. Now, in the case of the human genome, um, uh, heter uh, human, healthy human genomes have very low rates of heterozygosity, about 0.1 percent. So, if we look at this real data set back here, there is a little bit of heterozygosity, but it's not particularly pronounced. It doesn't even show up in the distribution here. But as we move into non-human species and into other you know, plants and animals, it's very common to get these multiple peaks observed in your data set. And what's interesting is then from that, you can, you can infer uh, the level, the, the sort of genome-wide average uh, level of heterozygosity uh, from your data. Uh, there's a good tool for this called GenomeScope, uh, where you just um, sort of input in your Kamer profile. In blue, this is making a plot of that Kamer distribution observed in your reads. And then it fits the statistical model onto the peaks in order to infer a variety of properties. So this particular example comes from a particular uh, F1 strain of Arabidopsis that was designed to be highly heterozygous. It was two kind of unrelated um, strains of, of Arabidopsis. Uh, and immediately we're able to kind of infer the haploid genome size is about 152 million bases long, which is correct. And we're also able to infer that the heterozygosity is about 1%. So that means about one every 100 bases or so, there'll be some difference between the maternal and paternal haplotypes uh, in this uh, plant species here. So the left plot is plotting, you know, kind of the coverage between zero and 120x uh, coverage. But if you zoom out, and here this is plotted in log log space, as you zoom out um, beyond 100 into say 10,000x or 100,000x coverage, you can observe kind of more uh, cameras along the way um, it gives you kind of uh, an even more detailed view imp impression about the sort of repeat composition across the whole genome. Here you can recognize, um, uh, in addition to kind of the nuclear genome, you can pull out features about, um, say, some of the chloroplasts, some of the mitochondria. Sometimes you can detect things like phi X contamination. Sometimes you can detect things like um, bacterial contamination. Uh, but you also detect things like satellite sequences that are just occurring in very high copy numbers. So. As simple as this Kamer analysis is, you can learn a lot of information about the genome size, the repeat content, heterozygosity, error rate, you know, lots of different properties can immediately be read out um, using this genome scope uh, algorithm that fits the statistical model. So when you assemble a genome, you know, what we really recommend you do, do a bit of QC using genome scope. There's some other um, uh, metrics like uh, fast QC to kind of analyze the quality values that are present there. But then assuming you have you know, sufficiently good coverage, sufficiently good coverage uh, and, and errors uh, rates, the next thing you're going to want to do is actually then start the assembler. And again, that's going to, that's going to build an assembly graph, um, either you know, looking at camers or looking at overlaps. Uh, and then it'll form you know, kind of a simple, the original graph where you know, it's either individual camers or individual reads that are kind of uh, used as nodes. And then we're going to try to compact this down um, to sort of simplify the graph as much as possible. Now, these initial um, simplifications will, will form what are sometimes called your initial contigs. Uh, some papers will call them unitigs, uh, unitig meaning an unambiguous contig sequence, uh, unipath, where that's an un unambiguous path through part of your genome assembly graph. Uh, but you'll kind of do this sort of um, simplification algorithm as much as possible. Now, of course, what you hope there is you would just get a single contig per chromosome. 
But in practice, um, you rarely you rarely will get a, a representation like that. Often you're going to have you know many cycles or loops to your graph. And there's several reasons why that might happen, why these contigs might end. So the one that you want is you get the end of the chromosome, and maybe you even can you know observe the telomere sequence that are present there. Another reason why a contig might end is if you had low coverage, or if you had zero x coverage, there's impossible to be able to sequence through there, so your contig will just sort of end. If you have uh, uh, errors in your uncorrected errors in your reads, that will create branch points in your graph, um, where your contigs will will pass full branch and your contigs will end. If there's heterozygosity in your sample, if, if you're if you're a human sample, the homozygous regions will assemble together, and then the heterozygous regions will, will form a branch point, come back together, branch point, come back together. You get these little bubbles that form uh, from all the heterozygosity. And then finally, uh, uh, you'll also get a lot of branch points in your graph and your contigs will end because of repeats. Um, for large eukaryotic genomes especially, it's going to be those repeats that are going to cause most of the complexity uh, inside a genome assembly. Uh, specifically, in the case of a mammalian genome, this comes from the human genome. More than 50% of it will be some type of repetitive sequence. Uh, a few major uh, classes in, say, the human genome are line and sign elements. These are a few hundred to a few thousand nucleotides long, where a lot of complexity in the genome, um, uh, you know, nearly uh, over 40% of the genome, well, uh, almost 40% of the genome will just be in these two classes alone. As we move beyond, say, mammalian genomes into, say, some of the larger plant genomes, you know, it's going to be even worse. That wheat genome, 16 gigabases filled with repetitive elements, pine genome, 24 gigabases just filled with transposable elements and other sort of repetitive elements that just are very, very difficult to assemble. Uh, good news is from the case, from the point of view of the assembler, you know, we can do some analysis um, uh, where we can try to detect in the partial uh, contigs, we can try to detect which contigs represent unique sequences and which sequences represent repetitive sequences. So if I have a genome sequence where there's uh, sort of uh, repetitive regions R1 and R2 interspersed with unique regions A, B, C, and A, B, and C, from the point of view of the assembler, all of the reads that fall into, the, into those repeats will kind of stack up on each other and will cause contigs that have twice as much coverage as the other unique sequences. So by doing an analysis based again on that sort of Poisson distribution based on a, a binomial distribution here, uh, we can sort of uh, put a score on every contig in order to um, predict, is this likely to occur from a unique sequence or is it more likely to come from a repetitive sequence? And if it comes from a repetitive sequence, you'll have an idea, oh yes, we need to place this contig you know, two or more times in our final uh, reconstruction. Uh, and then the last piece that we need in order to reassemble a genome, you know, we get our initial contigs, we get them scored by unique or repetitive. The last thing we need to do is bring in some other forts of information where we can actually span across you know, those repeats, we can span across um, those breakpoints in order to be able to turn this into an end-to-end -end representation of an entire chromosome. This process is called scaffolding, uh, where we'll you know, start from contigs. Uh, often those contigs are oriented in some sort of an assembly graph. Here, the big question is, do we start, you know, clearly we need to start at A and end up in D, but it's ambiguous. Should we go A into B? Uh, and then in C or D, or should we start in A and go into C and then into B or D? So we need some sort of information to resolve, you know, the ordering uh, 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 of these different contigs and, and how often we need to visit them exactly. So this extra information could be a few different forms. So if you're doing a luminous sequencing, it's very common to do paired end sequencing or mate pair sequencing. That gives you, you know, kind of a pair of reads where there's a known distance between them. That's good information for scaffolding. Although it's a little bit limited in the sense that with a luminous sequencing, even the mate pairs are typically less than 10,000 base pairs long, which is, is in the case of the human genome, is going to be not sufficient in order to get through the longest, uh, most complicated repeats that are present there. Other types of long range information you might bring could be just long reads. That will, you know, uh, give you lots of great information. Uh, there's other uh, types of sequencing you might do. There's something called high C sequencing. Um, we'll talk more about that in a minute, where you'll get these long range information um, where you get pairs of reads that could be separated by tens of thousands up to hundreds of thousands of base pairs apart. And that's great information for jumping over repeats in order to do scaffolding. And kind of the idea is if you bring in these other types of information, you can also bring in optical mapping data, you could bring in genetic mapping data. 
but some other type of information that says A should be you know, followed by B, B should be followed by C, and then C should be followed by D, some sort of other long range information about the chromosome structures. We can then sort of go back and sort of place them into a little, into a linear sequence uh, and, then, and then build out a linear molecule. A challenge that can occur during scaffolding, and you, and you see this with many genomes, including the reference human genome today, is things may be oriented into this linear molecule, but because of repeats, because of the complexity that might be present there, you could still have uh, what are called scaffold gaps or internal gaps, where we know that you know, there's, there's about, say, you know, there's a thousand bases or a million bases that ought to be here. We just don't know what those bases are. So we're going to fill them in with N characters. Um, in, case, in, in the case of the human reference genome to this day, if you're not using the TDT reference, you'll see that chromosome one, for example, begins with N, 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 where we know that there should be additional bases there. They just haven't been assembled. We just, uh, they weren't just uh, resolved in, in, the, in the references available. So be careful when you do scaffolding that you might see those N, N, N characters uh, will be parts of the genome that have just not yet been uh, fully resolved. Okay, so why do scaffolds end? It's the same reasons that contigs end, right? There could be a lack of, of coverage. There could be residual heterozygosity. There could be errors. Um, or maybe we just got lucky and we sort of biologically were able to reach the end of the chromosome. That's sort of the best case scenario. Although, you know, things like repeats and um, errors and heterozygosity are more common uh, uh, by far uh, to have uh, gaps along the way inside of a scaffold. Okay, so we've, we've talked about kind of the basic principles. Uh, you know, we're gonna build up graphs. Uh, we talked about when you do sequencing, you know, you need to oversample substantially. Uh, you can use tools like GenomeScope to assess your data to make sure it's high quality. Uh, and then uh, we talked about how uh, given high quality data um, and high coverage data, we can then sort of go through, build up our assembly uh, and then likely need other scaffolding information to kind of uh, assemble the complete uh, chromosomes. Uh, now, many genomes have been sequenced uh, with, say, Illumina sequencing, and you can, and yes, you can do de novo assembly of them. There's good tools like like Spades would be my recommendation today. There are good tools available for short read assembly, but because the reads are short, inevitably the assembly will be relatively poor. Um, you know, Spades is an excellent assembler given the data that it's available. But because, you know, especially mammalian genomes or vertebrate genomes have so many repeats, have so much heterozygosity, uh, with short reads, your contigs tend to only be a few thousand, tens of thousands of bases long uh, compared to the lengths of the chromosomes that are, you know, uh, tens of millions or hundreds of millions of bases long. So there's been a lot of interest to um, improve on de novo assembly. And I would argue this has been revolutionized in the last few years by uh, thanks to the improvements in long read assembly, specifically through PacBio and Oxford nanopore sequencing. In fact, in 2022, uh, myself and a few of my lab members, uh, we, and we wrote a perspective piece about how thanks to long read sequencing, you know, we're able to get um, you know, nearly complete genomes, transcriptomes, and epiomes uh, using long read sequencing. Uh, in fact, Nature Methods, the journal, you know, highlighted long read sequencing as the method of the year. It's really just become a, a turning point where you know now long read sequencing is giving us the best possible genomes uh, that are available. Uh, 2022 is sort of the, it, it was it was specifically a milestone year because this is when the uh, the telomere to telomere human reference genome was first assembled and first published, uh, where we had a complete representation of a human genome for the first time. It was just an incredible achievement. But that's just one example of the sort of the quality that we're getting now. Many different plants and animals, um, fungi, and uh, and beyond, now have uh, telomere to telomere representations, largely driven um, through improvements through long read sequencing. So, what's so special about long reads? So, here's another sort of cartoon illustration of a of a potential genome. We have repeats in R, uh, and then we have unique sequences A, B, C, D. Again, if we're just doing short read sequencing, where short reads means that the reads are shorter than those repetitive elements, the graph that we're going to form is going to have ambiguity. Again, we're just not sure if we should go into the repeat, then go next into B, if we should go into C, even though we know the beginning and end of the chromosome should be sections uh, A and D. However, if we can bring in, say, longer read sequencing, and longer here where we get little pieces from unique region A into unique B, from unique B into unique C, uh, from unique C into unique D, if we can bring in long read sequencing that spans those repetitive elements 
and maybe thread it through this graph or maybe just build a new graph um, if you have enough coverage of long reads, then we can lay out the, the precise ordering of all of these different segments and we can build out a long read complete uh, genome sequence that doesn't have any gaps, doesn't have any ambiguity. So long reads just intrinsically are easier to assemble and are much more likely to get through these repetitive elements. By analogy, you know, a genome assembly is often sort of thought about as being a jigsaw puzzle that you need to assemble. Uh, with long read sequencing, the pieces are much bigger, uh, which means that you'll need many fewer of them. Uh, and then thanks to say hi-fi sequencing, those pieces are you know, very accurate. So it becomes, you, know, you get a, a crystal clear picture uh, just using uh, long read sequencing. Um, so it's, it's highly recommended basically for any species now if you need to do de novo assembly. So the two uh, platforms that are really leading in this, uh, one comes from the company Pacific Biosciences, although everyone calls them PacBio. Uh, their flagship instrument shown on the left here is called the Revio. Uh, the previous generation was called the SQL2 that is displayed here. Both all these instruments, their, their whole lineup really is based on something called um, uh, uh, single molecule real-time sequencing that, or smart sequencing. Uh, so the basis of this is we're going to, uh, in our inside the instruments, uh, we're going to have a, a, a sequencing chip called a smart cell that will have uh, uh, millions of little holes embedded inside of, this, inside, of the, inside of the smart cell. Those little holes are called zero-mode waveguides. Now, what's really special about those zero-mode waveguides is they're big enough where molecules of DNA can go in, the holes are big enough where individual nucleotides can go in, even entire um, um, polymerase protein complexes can go in, but the hole nevertheless is smaller than the diameter of uh, the wavelength of light. The, whole, the diameter of the hole is smaller than the wavelength of light so that when you uh, shine a laser on the surface, um, only the very, very bottom of the hole, the very bottom of the zero mode waveguide will be illuminated by the, the laser light energy penetrating in here. So what we're going to do is we're going to have um, uh, molecules of DNA that we want to sequence. Um, we're going to uh, do sequencing by synthesis where there'll be single-stranded DNA, and then we're going to be synthesizing a complementary strand. Uh, the complementary strand, uh, those nucleotides will have little fluorescent tags uh, uh, incorporated along them. And then as this process is unfolding, we're going to shine a laser on it. Uh, and then the idea is, is we're only going to illuminate nucleotides um, that are being incorporated by the polymerase. That's sort of the idea. So the raw data from a, a PacBio instrument is a movie where over time we're going to be observing, um, you know, sort of the colored light that's present there. In the beginning, they'll have just sort of a baseline of color. Then we'll get, say, a bright spot of, of a, a color corresponding to an A nucleotide. It'll drop down to baseline again. Then we'll get another colored bright spot corresponding to a T nucleotide and so on. A really nice property of this is because we're observing single molecules of DNA is that there's no um, degradation in signal. Whereas Illumina sequencing, the quality tends to deteriorate over time. Uh, here, the sequencing accuracy is quite consistent. You get sort of consistent accuracy from the first base to the hundredth base, to the thousandth base, to the 10,000th base and beyond. You just get very uh, consistent accuracy. Now, the big challenge for smart sequencing is what we want to observe are nucleotides being incorporated along the polymerase. Unfortunately though, in addition to those nucleotides, we'll also get a bit of residual signal from other nucleotides that just happen to be floating into the zero mode waveguide, happen to get illuminated um, by the laser. So those extra nucleotides will be uh, imaged, we'll sequence them, we'll do base calling of them, that will lead to a higher rate of insertions uh, of where there's nucleotides that were observed, but they're not actually being incorporated on the template strand. So they'll create um, a higher rate of insertion errors along the way. Uh, the good news is those insertions are largely random and uh, they're very easy to correct for um, with enough coverage. So there's a very special mode of pack bio sequencing called hi-fi sequencing or circular consensus sequencing, where you have double-stranded DNA molecules that you want to sequence. And then on purpose, you read the forward strand, then the reverse strand, the forward strand, the reverse strand, the forward strand, the reverse strand multiple times. Those are called subreads. You fold up these subreads kind of like an, an accordion. You can compute the consensus of these subreads, uh, and that will create a new circular consensus read or a hi-fi read that is extremely accurate. Right, each of those subreads will have some level of insertions, but it's very unlikely to have the same insertion multiple times across all these different subreads. So they just uh, 
they get canceled out uh, very directly. Uh, and as a virtue of this, uh, hi-fi reads have a very low error rate. Uh, they have uh, far less than 1% error rate, something like 0.1% error rate after this uh, uh, sort of statistical correction in order to generate the consensus read. The sort of trade-off for this, though, is because you have to take the, the original, what's called plumerous read, chop it up into subreads, hi-fi reads tend to only be about 15,000 bases long, but they're very close to being perfect. And for de novo genome assembly, 15,000 bases will get you through the vast majority of, say, the human genome or other vertebrate genomes or, or you know, large stretches through plant genomes. So 15,000 base pair perfect reads are really a high quality, excellent data for pack biosequencing. There are certain parts of large uh, eukaryotic genomes where 15,000 base pair perfect reads nevertheless is not quite sufficient. Uh, where you need even longer reads. Uh, in the case of the human genome, you know, stretches like the centromere, rDNA arrays, uh, some segmental duplications, other, you know, very complex, you know, highly repetitive regions need even longer reads. And for that, the, the technology of choice is Oxford Nanopore uh, ultra-long read sequencing. Ultra-long uh, meaning that we're going to be specifically targeting reads that are uh, 100,000 base pairs or longer. So whereas hi-fi reads tend to max out at about 15 KB, here we're going to be uh, specifically targeting reads that are 100,000 base pairs longer. So you get sort of the equivalent of, I don't know, eight or so uh, hi-fi reads uh, 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 sort of assembled back to back to back in a single uh, Oxford nanopore read, a, a single uh, nanopore read coming out. The longest uh, nanopore read I've ever seen has been a few million bases long. The longest one that's ever been reported is a bit over 4 million bases long in a single read. That's close to an entire bacterial chromosome uh, in a single read, just sort of read directly out of the sequencer. So the basis of Oxford nanopore sequencing, it starts with double-stranded DNA um, at, uh, where you attach what is called the motor protein. The motor protein acts like a helicase where the double-stranded DNA is separated. Uh, one strand of the DNA then passes through this protein pore um, uh, hole here. As the, as the uh, single-stranded DNA passes through there, um, uh, DNA is an acid, uh, deoxyribonucleic acid. It's in a charged environment. Uh, and, and because uh, DNA is in this charged environment, there'll be, um, in, a, with, in the presence of an electrical field, there'll be variable um, resistance that will lead to variable current that can be measured there. So an Oxford nanopore sequencer, the, the base data that is being collected is changes in current over time as DNA strands uh, pass through it. The changes in current are incredibly small. They're on the level of um, about one picoamp changes as different nucleotides uh, pass through the hole, pass through the pore. A, a sort of challenge associated with nanopore sequencing is the, you know, the, the molecules that you're reading off that are sensed. Uh, the protein pore, the, the nanopore here, is actually going to be taller than one nucleotide. Commonly, in the case of R9 chemistry, you're going to be seeing maybe six nucleotides will be really in there. In the case of R10 uh, chemistry, you're going to be reading about uh, nine or ten nucleotides. In fact, there's even larger context that will that will subtly alter the current that is present there. So you don't get sort of a one-to-one -one readout of one nucleotide to one current re readout. Instead, what you get is a whole kamer will you observe a current measure from it, from that, the motor protein will then advance, you'll get a new kamer in the pore, you'll get a new set of currents, and then you'll keep advancing. The good news is, um, uh, is because you're reading at the level of kamers and kamers have to be overlapping and consecutive, um, the raw, even though the raw signal measurements are a little bit noisy, you get this oversampling where you'll observe each nucleotide k times where K will be the length of the kamer, commonly six to 10 times. And that's very effective for reducing the error that's associated with nanopore sequencing. Today with modern base callers um, using uh, recurrent neural networks or transformers, the modal uh, uh, accuracy is something like 99% or better. Um, although you do get a bit of a tail where some of the reads will only be 98% or 97%, not into 95%. You can often detect when reads have lower um, accuracy. Uh, you'll get you know, a quality value measurement. It's very common to just uh, filter out reads that are very low accuracy from your uh, de novo assembly, uh, and then just sort of pre preferentially prefer reads that are higher accuracy and preferentially prefer reads that are longer, right? So if you can collect reads that are 100 KB and more than 99% accurate, that's out outstanding data for de novo assembly. You're gonna get a really high quality assembly out um, using such data.
Okay, so now that we can uh, collect data, um, whereas with short read sequencing, that's commonly assembled through a De Bruijn graph assembler. Uh, for long read sequencing, we're often going to be computing an overlap graph. We're going to take entire you know, 100,000 base pair reads compared to other 100,000 base pair reads and keep track of the overlaps between them. Um, so that'll just, um, just give us a lot more information to resolve some of those uh, tricky repeats that are present there. The main downside for it is computationally it requires more work to look for those overlaps. Although modern de novo long read assemblers have really optimized that approach where a typical mammalian genome now uh, could be assembled like in a few thousand core hours, uh, whereas years ago it would take hundreds of thousands or millions of core hours uh, to assemble a, a, a mammalian genome with long reads. So there's been you know, orders of magnitude improvement on the assembly side uh, through better software, through better algorithms uh, that, can, that can play out there. Uh, just, I, just one thing I want to comment is, you know, it starts with overlaps between individual reads. A very sort of important step inside of the assembler is then to analyze those patterns of overlaps to derive what's commonly called the string graph. The idea is, is that many of the overlaps that are present there in the initial um, graph will be redundant. Uh, the idea is if you have, you know, a set of reads where read A overlaps read B overlaps read C, you may observe kind of long range overlaps between A, read A and read C that will be redundant. So we can analyze those chains of overlaps, remove redundant ones, um, you know, reads that are contained, a short read contained inside of a longer read. You can have um, transitive edges between um, uh, different overlapping reads that we can then remove, simplify it. The outcome from this though will be initial contigs, uh, AKA unitigs that are very much like those compacted De Bruijn graphs where you'll kind of compact it down as much as you can where there's no ambiguity. But then similar to that you know, a, a De Bruijn graph assembler, then you're gonna need to overlay some sort of long range information. It could be Oxford nanopore long uh, reads. It could be high C data. It could be optical mapping data. It could be a genetic map, some sort of other information to be able to take your initial contigs, lay them out into complete chromosomes. In the case of the, that telomere to telomere human genome, that T to T human genome, it was an assembly of uh, what's called the complete hididiform mole, that's CHM, and the specific cell line is CHM13. This is the, the string graph, this is the assembly graph that came out. It's relatively simple. Um, uh, uh, each sort of colored, uh, it looks like little pieces of string or little noodles here. This is using that bandage um, genome assembly viewer. Each of these colored uh, uh, segments here are colored by the chromosome that they come from. And what's exciting to me is most of the time we're getting either complete chromosome arms or potentially even complete chromosomes assembled into one long uh, sort of simple path uh, through the graph here. There are a few com complex regions where you get sort of interlocking pieces where it's not clear what's coming on here. This is formed by the RDNA array where you get a representation but on multiple chromosomes. And the RDNA array spans for millions of bases. So it's just, uh, it remains the most challenging part of the human genome to correctly resolve through. Although there has been a lot of work, um, thanks to like say, for example, Verco assemblers that can integrate in hi-fi data with ultra long nanopore reads, you can often get complete um, telomere to telomere chromosomes using that Verco assembler. So uh, uh, after you have your assembler, uh, we need to do some sort of scaffolding. A popular approach for this is bio nano optical mapping uh, data. The idea is that we're going to physically stretch out uh, long molecules of DNA, so molecules that are hundreds and a thousand or millions of bases long. We're going to stretch them out, and then we're going to visualize the spacing of particular motifs along those molecules uh, by using a little um, uh, restriction digest probe that can find those motifs separated along there. Uh, the good news is, is those uh, the spacing of those uh, motifs uh, will determine a fingerprint from every molecule. And similar to how you can assemble reads, you can assemble these fingerprints into, you know, of, of molecules that are, say, a million bases long. We can assemble, assemble those uh, fingerprints into maps that can span entire chromosomes. So it's a little bit like sequence assembly, but we're going to be assembling those um, spacing between the motifs uh, and then hopefully give you the spacing uh, fingerprint uh, for a whole chromosome. You can then compare that spacing fingerprint of your uh, optical mapping data to the fingerprint that you can derive in silico from your contigs. So then you'll know, oh, my contig should be placed on this part of this chromosome. This other contig should be placed on this part of this chromosome. This other contig should be placed on this other part of this chromosome. Lay out your sequence assembled contigs across the whole optical map 
and hopefully give you a, a complete chromosome, um, give you a complete genome in that way. You can also do things like uh, detect structural variants using this optical mapping data in, in a high throughput, relatively low cost approach. Uh, so it these data have um, a variety of applications for them. Another type of data that you can use for scaffolding is called high c There's a few vendors that provide kits for this. Um, the one that we really like is called ARIMA. Uh, they have an excellent kit for deriving these type of data. So high c uh, sequencing uh, is a way to kind of look for um, a chromatin confirmation where inside of cells, the DNA kind of folds up and gets rearranged. And the kind of the good news is most of the times when you get DNA folded up on itself, by far the vast majority of the time, uh, the, the pieces that will be nearby to each other in three-dimensional space will be physically nearby to each other on the linear chromosome molecules. So we're going to take DNA that's all folded up inside of a cell. We're going to cross-link it. We're going to cut it up with restriction digests. Then we're going to sequence these molecules where half the molecule will come from kind of one part of the chromosome, and then half the molecule will come from some other part of their chromosome that happened to be nearby in three-dimensional space. Again, though, most of the time that will come from molecule, uh, that will come from nearby positions along a chromosome. We do this for many, many millions of pairs of molecules, uh, millions and millions of pairs of reads. Uh, you can think of those as generating mate pairs where the, the pair of reads, you know, come from individual molecules, just that the distance between them is, is variable. Sometimes they'll be, you know, kind of right next to each other. Uh, sometimes they'll be, you know, thousands of bases apart, hundreds of thousands of base pairs apart. Occasionally, there'll be millions of base pairs apart. Occasionally, there will be a transient interaction between one chromosome and a completely different chromosome. But you'll, but those interactions tend to be um, uh, substantially fewer than uh, interactions that are kind of nearby on the same chromosome, nearby kind of insists on the same molecule. So from these pairs of reads, we can build a contact map which measures how often is there a pair of reads where one piece is mapping here and then the other piece is mapping someplace else. Most of those contacts are gonna be in cis nearby to each other on chromosomes. And that will be great data for using scaffolding. Where if we see that there's a pair of contigs that we're not sure initially about their orientation, if we observe that there's lots of high C pairs between them, we're pretty sure that they should go right next to each other. We can look at sort of the relative um, positioning, our, you know, amongst these contigs, we can, in addition to knowing they should go next to each other, we can determine, you know, the relative uh, orientation of those contigs. So high C data is excellent data as well in order to uh, scaffold an assembly and build out a linear molecule. Another sort of uh, real consideration for, um, uh, 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 you know, vertebrate genome assemblies, many of the genomes that you're going to be assembling are going to be diploid or have higher ploidy. Uh, those different copies may have different um, uh, patterns of variation. And unless they're incredibly inbred, there's going to be some variation uh, across those different um, uh, chromosomes that we're going to need to uh, be able to resolve. So uh, uh, the good news is in the modern era, uh, you can do that phasing uh, in a few different ways. The original approaches, um, like the Falcon assembler uh, from Jason Chin et al., you know, just use long read sequencing itself in order to represent where the two haplotypes diverge from each other. Uh, that, that led you uh, to kind of create this bubble uh, representation in the assembler where homozygous regions would assemble together. They'll branch across heterozygous regions, come back together. But then we can kind of unzip all those different bubbles and derive primary contigs and then a supple haplotigs that come from the other, um, uh, the other uh, uh, homologous chromosome. Uh, other things you can do is bring in high c data. And uh, again, because most of those uh, physical interactions through high c will be in cis, we can use that to resolve when there's ambiguity about which uh, sequence assemblies should be connected to each other. We can also use optical mapping data in a similar way in order to resolve heterozygous uh, contigs if they're large enough. Another thing you can do is if you have access to the parents, you can do so-called trio phasing. We commonly this is done as sort of uh, shotgun sequencing of the two parents separately. Then you scan through your reads and you look for cambers where that you can unambiguously assign to be, being from one parent or the other parent. That lets you partition the reads into two sets and then you can assemble those two sets separately. Uh, and that works extremely well in order to phase the reads and then you can uh, then assemble separately the two haplotypes and you'll know which is the maternal and which is the paternal uh, sets of assemblies. 
So there's, you know, there's a variety of approaches, starting with just long reads and then uh, uh, also incorporating high seas, uh, optical mapping, or e potentially even uh, uh, trio-based data from the parents in order to resolve this. So, and then finally, kind of the last part is uh, say a little bit about the algorithms. So these days there are a variety of algorithms available for hi-fi data, for uh, uh, Oxford nanopore data. For hi-fi data, um, the sort of leading assemblers, there's something called High Canoe that I referenced a minute ago. There's another assembler called Verco. But for sort of general uh, hi-fi based assembly, a really good assembler, it's very fast. It gives you very accurate assemblies. It's called Hi-Fi ASM, uh, developed in the lane of Heng Lee uh, up at Dana-Farber and Harvard. So it, it starts by looking at individual um, uh, sets of reads. It does some error correction upon them. It then builds an assembly graph between um, uh, all those reads. And then like that Falcon assembler, it can separate, it can recognize when there's bubbles in the assembly graph because of heterozygosity, give you a primary assembly and then give you alternate contigs representing uh, the alternate uh, haplotypes that might be present there. Uh, for mammalian genomes, this will, t this will often get you assemblies where your contig N50 will be, be measured in several megabases. Um, you get really nice contigs, really nice assemblies, um, you know, right out, of, um, right out of the assembler with enough coverage. Uh, a more recent uh, extension to this algorithm is the Hi-Fi hi ASM Hi-C assembler. It's sort of a special mode of Hi-Fi uh, ASM, where in addition to running uh, Hi-Fi uh, ASM, just the assembler, you also incorporate high c reads where you can map out in the assembly graph uh, how the different uh, sequences should be uh, related to each other. And that will do an excellent job at um, uh, building uh, separate uh, assemblies for the maternal and paternal uh, chromosomes. Now, a challenge if you're just using high uh, c data for, uh, for scaffolding is you won't know which is maternal and which is paternal. You can sometimes look for you know, kind of markers of genes that, where you know that they only, especially in say the sex chromosomes, where you know that you know a special genes should be present only on one um, uh, on the maternal or paternal chromosomes. If you know that there's sort of imprinting of genes, if you have RNA seq data, you can sometimes use that to resolve what's maternal and paternal. If there's other sort of epigenetic information, uh, that again that you might be able to use that. Uh, but the, the sort of the gold standard for this assignment is often trio data, where if you do some sequencing from the parents, it could just be. Uh, sort of shotgun uh, Illumina data from the parents, that's often sufficiently um, powerful to, to find KMERS as markers that are unique to the maternal paternal chromosome. So we're getting sort of excellent assemblies. Uh, I highly recommend Hi-Fi ASM with Hi-Fi data in order to get excellent genome assemblies out of the assembler. Uh, in addition, though, to that Hi-Fi ASM, you know, there's a variety of sort of pre-processing steps you need to do, like genome scope and FASTQC. Uh, there's a variety of sort of downstream uh, quality control steps you want to do, like run Mercury to evaluate the accuracy, run Busco uh, to look at gene content. Potentially, you want to do uh, more detailed gene annotations along the way. So the Galaxy Project has been working very closely with the Vertebra Genomes Project to develop really scalable, accessible uh, pipelines that, that can be used in order to develop um, reproducibly reference genomes um, all inside of Galaxy. So th through the rest of the day here, we're going to be deriving, we're going to be talking about the tutorials that will guide you step by step by step through all these processes from the initial QC to running the assembler, to running the scaffolder, to doing the, the downstream QC in order to get reference genomes entirely inside of Galaxy, entirely inside of the user interface. Uh, so at a click of a button, we're going to teach you how to launch the assembler, evaluate the inputs, and evaluate the outputs of that whole process. Uh, we published a paper about this uh, earlier this year. Um, my, my colleague Delphine is the first author, but this was just a great um, sort of partnership between the Verba Genomes Project and the Galaxy Project in order to develop this really hardened pipeline. I should also comment, um, even though this is pipeline, we continue to actively develop this workflow. There's been a lot of innovation recently to uh, op further optimize the computational resources involved. We're also doing a lot of work to develop um, uh, automated uh, annotation pipelines so you can find genes and repeats and other features automatically, all in a push of a button. We've applied this to dozens of species in the paper. We've applied it to more than 50 species. Uh, but in partnership with the VGP, we've applied this exact workflow to now hundreds of different species, giving excellent results um, every time. So it's highly recommended for any projects. Um, and we'll tell you all about uh, the requirements for the pipeline and how to run it in the tutorials uh, following this little presentation. So the assembly process is highly uh, hierarchical. 
We're going to start from individual reads. We're going to build up you know, an assembly graph that will let us build up high confidence contigs. Uh, from those contigs, we can incorporate other long information to build up scaffolds. Uh, uh, then we can build up the scaffolds into hopefully building up complete uh, chromosomes. If you need to run an assembler, there's a few ingredients you absolutely have to have. You have to have uh, sufficient coverage um, so that you don't have dropouts where you have zero coverage. If you're looking at a heterozygous sample, low coverage also means you need to have high coverage of each um, uh, homologous chromosome. So you should scale proportionally to the ploidy. And then really the key here is having long reads because that will help you get through the repeat composition. Uh, and then things like hi-fi reads especially have low error rates. So you're gonna get a really excellent assembly. Uh, if you have um, uh, Oxford nanopore reads, there are some assemblers uh, also available. There's an assembler called Fly, for example. Uh, there's um, other assemblers for, long, for Oxford nanopore data. A very new approach is um, there's some uh, error correction pipelines, one called Hero, for example, uh, that does an excellent job about taking uh, Oxford nanopore data, does some pre-polishing of those reads for your assembly. But nevertheless, kind of long, high-quality reads are the key to a high-quality uh, genome assembly. So thank you for your time and attention today. Um, if you have any questions, reach out to the Galaxy Project and good luck with your assemblies. Hopefully our workflows will work out for you, but we're here to help you along the way. All right, thank you everyone. Good luck.